music. Who doesn't love music? There are so many varying forms and bands and artists and genres. There is something for absolutely everyone. It is one of the things that kind of transcends anything that might divide us. And it's something that we all have in common. We all love good music, but we might not like so much bad music. And a lot of people might associate bad music with strange and experimental music. And this is kind of where we're getting at today, is that I have scoured the internet with help from this iceberg chart, and I have found some of the most peculiar sounds and songs you could imagine. And so in this video, we're going to go down the strange music iceberg and talk about artists, albums, and even songs that just have a hint of strangeness to them. And so as we dig down the iceberg and we get deeper, things are going to get a bit weird. Also, stick around to the end because I have a really cool announcement I want to do, and this is the perfect video to do it. So anyway, without further ado, this is the strangest music iceberg explained. Up first, we have the Bonzo Dog Duda Band, who were a group comprised of art students back in the 1960s. Their sound, I would say, is actually quite similar to the Beatles in their Sgt. Pepper's album, but these guys are perhaps a little bit weirder than the Beatles ever were on those tracks, even though we will get into one or two of them further down the iceberg. Now, as for the Bonzo Dog Duda Band, their most kind of popular hit, I guess, was I Am The Urban Spaceman, and it kind of reminds me of something like Octopus's garden. It's just a little bit jazzier, I would say. And they also like to introduce a bit of humour into their songs, which is kind of, you know, always fun, lighthearted. And the band came to public attention through a 1968 ITV comedy show, Do Not Adjust Your Set. So it's a fun band. It's kind of not that popular, but a little bit obscure. But even with their name, you kind of know these guys are a bit quirky and stuff. Not too crazy, though. So let's start heading down and find out what awaits us. All right, things are going to get real here for a second because we have Caretaker's everywhere at the end of time. So the reason why this is here, it's so high up, the reason it is here is because it is really kind of overdone, I guess, with iceberg charts. Every single one has the caretakers everywhere at the end of time. So I assume that the creators of this iceberg put it kind of high up because at this point, most people know about it. But if you don't, it is a six hour piece of absolute musical kind of art. And it's so strange, but it is haunting so, so haunting. And the idea of it is basically the stages of dementia. And it's a deep subject and how at the start, everything is kind of fine. It's really nice, jazzy, old style music playing. And as the album goes on, it starts deteriorating and fast. And it is absolutely terrifying. It is an absolutely terrifying piece of music. The comment section there is just as bad. People have some harrowing stories and it has really kind of put, at least for me, my thoughts on the elderly and dementia into a new frame of mind. It is terrifying. It is a beautiful piece of art, but it's an abstract descent into madness and it's harrowing. So up next, I have Window Licker by Aphex Twin. And this one is also quite kind of, I guess, abstract already. We are already at quite an abstract level. It is a strange one because it's almost like a techno song with some weird background noise. There's like moans and groans in the background. And I guess as we go down, you'll find out that things do get a bit darker and more abstract. This is still the semblance of a song, but there is something kind of off-putting with it, just with the kind of constant background moans. It's six minutes of experimentation and weirdness. I don't have too much else to say about it, so let's move on. Being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. This is the first of two Beatles songs we'll get to, and I guess it kind of signifies something else I want to talk about because the Beatles were were absolutely kind of insane. When you look at where they came from in 1962 to where they ended up in 1968, you couldn't have had a further progression just in music in general. And the inspiration behind being for the benefit of Mr. Kite is that I believe that John Lennon had this poster of a circus and one of the performers there was, I guess, working for Mr. Kite. Oh, man, and 
nicely through a hogshead of real fire. In this way, Mr. Gay will challenge the world. It's believed that Mr. Kite was a 19th century circus performer who worked at Pablo Fanke's circus in Rochdale back in the 1840s, Pablo being the first non-white circus owner. And <laughs> there's this story that when they wrote Sergeant Peppers, they went into a studio for four months and just got super baked and came out with like the most fresh and original album of all time. And being for the benefit of Mr. Kite is kind of like a bad trip. They definitely had a bad trip one week and wrote that one. <laughs> um, it's a strange song, but the inspiration being that a guy that must have died about 100 years before before, who worked at a circus that had almost been forgotten by the world, just being on a poster is absolutely incredible. The song itself is just weird, but that was the Beatles. That was their later work, just trying to do something new, something fresh, something original. And they absolutely did it here. It's a weird song, but if you like kind of the weird and disturbing and wacky, then being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, if you haven't heard it before, is a kind of fun one to check out. Lavender Town is up next on the iceberg. And I've actually spoken about Lavender Town a little bit in the past, way back in like one of my Nintendo videos, I think. So that would have been a good couple of months ago. And the idea is that kids listen to the Lavender Town theme song and then would kill themselves. This was absolutely false. There was never a kind of case that was tied back to Lavender Town. It was a creepypasta. Was it creepy and abstract for a children's game? Absolutely. But it did not do anything that people said it did. It was just a creepy song. This is a really strange one. It is The Unseen Power of the Picket Fence by Pavement. And what makes this one interesting is that after about four minutes of the song, things take a bit of a dark change. You think that the song is over, but then you start hearing some talking, some chattering. Hey, sir! 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 Now, I don't know what the ending means. I haven't spoken to Pavement and asked, <laughs> um, but I definitely do think there's something in there. If you have an idea of what it means, let me know down below, because I know that Pavement are quite a popular band, but this song in particular is kind of interesting just because of how it changes throughout, because you think it's over and then it's, I guess it has this secondary story underneath. So yeah, a little interesting one, that one. We're heading back down Penny Lane to talk about the Beatles for the second and final time in this video. And this one, I believe, was actually parodied on The Simpsons. I definitely remember something quite similar to it. Number eight. Uh. Number eight. Uh. Number eight. Uh. Number eight. Uh. It is perhaps their most abstract song, Revolution Nine, the one that sounds like an acid trip gone wrong. <laughs> number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. The first 20 seconds of this song is just repeated number nine, number nine, number nine. And then this is followed by eight minutes of kind of like background chatter, reverse noises and stuff all around strangeness. So it definitely does get its place on the iceberg. It still bewilders me that these guys were together for seven years and they went all the way from like, I don't know, hard day's night to this. I guess just when you look back at the early 60s stuff they were doing in, you know, 62, them in their suits and that, compare that to this, which is completely off the wall, avant-garde as you like. It really is a crazy change. Simply outstanding. Next, we have 100 Gex, and I don't really know what's going on here, if I'm very honest. They are an American duo comprised of Dylan Brady and Lauren Tez, releasing their first album back in 2019, and they've been described as hyperpop, which is a genre that I had never heard about before, but these guys are definitely it. <laughs> A lot of people think that they are it as well because they have 1.4 million monthly streams on Spotify. Here's the thing though, their music, at least the songs that I've listened to, are auto-tuned to high heaven, ear rapey as frick. <laughs> I think that the word hyperpop is actually a really, really good way to describe them. It's not really for me, but it's pretty intense pop music. <laughs> it's lighthearted, but at the same time, it's like in your face, right at you. 
It's not subtle in the slightest, and the bass is just there in your ears. Not my cup of tea, but it is strange, it's unique, it is original. As I said, I had never heard of Hyperbop before. I haven't seen many artists do this, and that's probably why they are so popular, so big right now, is because they're doing something that no one else is doing. They found a niche in the market because no one else, at least not that I know of, is supplying that, like, bang, in-your-face, light-hearted feel. So they are a very interesting pair. They're Coming to Take Me Away by Napoleon XIV. This song has been stuck in my head for the past two days, and I hate it. They're coming to take me away, ho ho, hee hee, ha ha, to the funny farm where life is beautiful all the time. I'll say this about all of them, but this is an interesting one because whilst at first uh, I assumed that it was about a man that was going crazy and stuff, I actually read up on the meaning of the song and I was completely right. It's about a man whose girlfriend's recently left him and he is, I guess, driven to madness because of it. And the song's kind of just normal. And then I guess his voice gets shifted up and up and up and up to the point where it's really, really annoying to listen to, especially because I can still hear it in my mind. It's stuck in my head. I know the Germans have a word for it where, where like a song is stuck in your head, but I've forgotten the name. So let me know, German fans, what is that name? The song is about what I thought it was about. So that is a bit of a testament to, I guess, the good writing or the technique that they used, which is like fair play to Napoleon 14 or XIV or whatever they're called. Fair play to them. Weird song. But it does hit the nail on the head with its message because even me as a first time listener can identify what he's going for straight away. I really like this one. Moondog was an American musician and local icon around New York. This blind virtuoso would be found on 6th Avenue between 52nd and 55th Street wearing a cloak and a horned helmet, sometimes busking or selling music. Here's the thing though, Moondog was blind and he's someone that I can absolutely have like the utmost respect for because he is so much more gifted at music than someone like I will ever be, despite the fact that he can't see what he's playing. He just knows. And that is something that is just instinctual inside him. A lot of passersby didn't actually know that this guy is relatively famous. He has over 200,000 monthly listens on Spotify right now. And this is despite the fact that he died back in 1999 at the age of 83. And so whilst you might have seen him and just thought he was another crazy New York busker, there was a lot more kind of deeper to him, I guess, than First Meets the Eye, that, you know, a guy wearing a cloak and a horned helmet. But I'm sure he was quite popular back then. And even now, 22 years after his death, he's still having hundreds of thousands of monthly listens, which is incredible, absolutely incredible. His music itself is actually really beautiful to listen to. It's not perhaps as strange as some of the things that we'll get onto quite soon, but I guess more his story is just so fascinating. <laughs> Isao Tamisa was a Japanese composer and is known as one of the forefathers of electronic music and space music. Much of his work is electronic adaptations of really famous songs and it's so interesting to listen to. He did a cover of perhaps my favourite New Age song, Claire de Lune, and this is an it's another beast of a song. Tamita's rendition is much more sci-fi like, but I mean, you could just get taken to this place far in the future with UFOs and shooting stars, listening to glow the night sky, listening to this. It's absolute beauty. I'm sure that there's such a mood for it because it is completely just bliss. And a lot of the songs he does are also kind of space adaptations almost. They sound a lot spacier. And you wouldn't think that something like, I guess, Claire de Lune would work, but it so does. It so does. Tamita himself was born in 1932 and died back in 2016, still remembered to this day as one of the forefathers of electronic music because he just did it so well. I I'm just so glad that I get to do this, I guess, from time to time as like a hobby, finding out about these great men and women that have done some fantastic and out-of-the-box things. It's really, really fun. The Race for Space by Public Service Broadcasting. This is actually a band and not some government thing that you would think it was by their name. I did at least. And this is definitely my favourite part of the iceberg. I love this stuff where it's weird, it's out there, it's wacky. 
but it's not too far gone yet because we'll get down to the stuff that's really detached from reality later down. But right now there's the strings of reality kind of holding it back so it still has something to latch onto, but it's way gone. It's just avant-garde. It's so unique and original and fresh. And this... The Race of Space is both the name of a song and also the name of an album that was released back in 2014. This is one of the most unique albums I've ever listened to because basically this album is an instrumental background and then on top of it is, I guess, people speaking almost like they're communicating to astronauts and stuff. Imagine Space Odyssey, except minus, I guess, Captain Tom speaking. It's kind of people at base control chatting to each other. I think there's one track, which is John F. Kennedy's speech about going to the moon over the top of background music. It's so, it's such a delight to listen to because it's just new. It's original. It's unique. Would I put this on my playlist? Probably not, but it is so great that it exists anyway. And I'm sure there is a mood to listen to it because it is just so fresh and undone. At least to my knowledge, this kind of stuff hasn't been done before, so it is really interesting to see some strange music that does have some ties to just, I guess, being good. Lift your skinny fists like antennas to heaven by Godspeed you, Black Emperor. Now, we're starting to get into the weird stuff because I don't really have too many words to say for this. It's both the name of a song and also an album, and the song itself is 18 minutes long. And I think you'll actually find a lot of the songs on this video tend to go on for 10, 20, 30 minutes. It starts off with some chimes, I think, kind of like a demented ice cream truck. And then three minutes in, some French girls start singing some nursery rhymes. <laughs> then it gets spooky quiet and then picks up again into some cool heavy guitar licks. Yeah, I remember this one now. And then it dies again and it comes back alive and it dies for a final time. About 10 minutes in, there's this really kind of mellow acoustic guitar. And that's my favorite part of the song. I quite like that bit. But a lot of it is just almost deafening quietness for a song. There's not too much going on for large parts of the song. It's experimentation, yes. Does it hold up as well as some of the more recent entries? Probably not, but there are some parts that it's like, okay, actually, that's quite nice. But I guess if you're having this on your playlist and stuff, this song is 20 minutes, and if you don't like six minutes of it, then you had to skip that, and it's just, it's just a bit of a mess, to be honest. This one personally annoys me because I thought I had withstood the years of torture that was chimpmunkifying songs but apparently not. Apparently those days are still around me as I stand and breathe listening to this drivel. This is audible torture. The lyrics are whack, okay? <laughs> the chipmunkifying the voices just makes no sense. I hate everything about it so much. They're talking about fish heads. Why fish heads? I understand it's experimentation, it's strange, it's unique, it's weird, but it's just the chimpmunkifying, man. Like, the fact that I had to sit here and listen to this. Fish heads, fish heads, roly -poly fish heads. It annoys me. <laughs> Roly-poly fish heads are never seen drinking a cappuccino in Italian restaurants with Oriental women. Yeah. Those are the lyrics. Those are actual lyrics inside the song. What does that mean? Fish heads aren't drinking cappuccinos with Asian chicks. I saw I Can't Get No Satisfaction on the list, and I was wondering, why is this here? But then I realised the song isn't done by the Rolling Stones, and no, 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 no. It's actually done by Devo from the album Q, Are We Not Men? A, We Are Devo. And after seeing their banner, I understood that I was going to be in for a bit of a ride. These guys are a bit kind of avant-garde. These guys are a bit experimental. These guys are a bit new and unique. Yeah, it's actually kind of interesting to see how different they can be. Might I also say that the music video for it, I'm watching it now, that's what they're actually getting at, is that the music video is just so weird. It's, I mean, people look to be having like spasms right now and uh, convulsions, and it is a very, they're wearing goggles. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a weird one to be fair. And we'll actually see later on, there are some weird music videos. So we'll kind of get into those as we go down. 
the books. These guys are actually really interesting because they have a very peculiar way of making music. The American Dutch duo is comprised of vocalist Nick Zamuto and cellist Paul de Jong, and their music is described as perhaps being its own genre. This is quite interesting. They are known as, I guess, like collage or something. They're like collage genre. And so instead of seeing themselves kind of similar to like the American service broadcasters or something, they will play a background beat and they'll have some sort of people speaking kind of over the top and it goes in tune. And this one I was listening to, the most popular one, I think it was like about some kid. He kept on saying how he's going to stab and mutilate people. And it's kind of dark and it's kind of creepy, but it does work a little bit. Yeah, Cold Freezing Night, that's the one. And it's just about a boy who's like, going to murder someone. It's got screams. It's got a lot of like weird stuff in it. Stay love him oh, as long as I want you to, because so I can kill you. But it is kind of unique to see how they do it. And like this is music. This At the end of the day, this is music. And, and that's what I do love about art is that this is music just as much as Katy Perry is music. <laughs> or like, you know, or any, any big artist you want to throw their name in there very experimental, very outside the box thinking, but it does work. It's not for me. No way am I going to listen to this because it's kind of a little bit twisted, but it's definitely something I haven't seen before. So whilst with the books, I can give them credit because I know what they're going for. The band Clowncore are really something else. They're on this iceberg. So shout out to the Clowncore fans <laughs> with songs like The Flat Earth and The Infinite Realm of Incomprehensible Suffering, Google Your Own Death and You're Pregnant. What isn't there to love about Clowncore? I would describe their music right as you're going up on a roller coaster and you're like slowly building, slowly building. And then the roller coaster stops right at the top for just a moment. And then bang down and it just goes. It's dead quiet. And then it just explodes into music just for a few seconds. And then it'll go back down to kind of how it was before. <laughs> It's crazy. It's like opening up a Pandora's box or something where it's all quiet before. Bang! It's perhaps a good time if you don't mind going between deafening quietness and deafening loudness. One of the more kind of, whoa, what's going on here kind of bands I've covered so far. Oh yeah, okay, now we're really getting into some obscure stuff because we have staple tapeworms to my by Passenger of Hmm. Like the song name, like the band name, good start. Obviously, the title gives away that this is a weird song, and weird, it most certainly is. It starts off with this really gravelly voice reading out the title of the song, followed by a really high-pitched scream, and oh yeah, it's like nails on a chalkboard. I hate it so much. Stuff like this, to me, is just noise. Like, I can understand that, you know, obviously art is subjective and stuff. To me, this is just noise. <laughs> it can be classed as music, but it's also just noise. <laughs> There's a lot of screaming and it's kind of annoying to me, but the band Passenger of they made this in 2006 and they did not release another song until an EP in 2015, where they released, I think, three or four. Having listened to one or two of the songs on the EP, I can say that despite having a nine year gap, their sound has not changed. It's still a lot of like, <laughs> it's still a lot of very loud shouting and very loud sounds. I don't know how many passenger fans we might have in the video, but I mean, I don't care. I'm just going to move on. The Shags were an all-female American rock group that started back in the 1960s, composing of four sisters, those being Dot, Betty, Helen, and Rachel. Now, unlike some of the other bands on this list that are just kind of weird, the Shags were actually known for being bad. <laughs> and I don't know why, as of all bad bands that have ever formed, these ladies got it quite rough. For some reason, they were put in the Rolling Stone magazine and they were given, I guess, a review which said, and I quote, sounding like lobotomized trap family singers. That's a bit mean. 
like I know you listen to their music and they don't have any musical talent really. I'm sorry, but why can't they just have a bit of fun and play music that they like to? They were doing kind of local tours and stuff around the time that I guess they had the review because everyone was like, oh, these girls, you know, they're in the Rolling Stones. I, I do feel that they kind of got a bit hard done by because like they're not good. My pal's name is Football. He always likes to roam. My pal's name is Football. I never find him home. The band broke up after the death of their brother in 1975, performing locally afterwards. It's a half interesting story, to be honest, but it's one that's a little bit like, out of all bands of all time, these ones were specifically chosen and made an example out of for being bad. The most mysterious song on the internet. So I've actually covered this a little bit before in, I believe it was my Unsolved Mysteries Part 2 video. So go watch that one after this. But the essential breakdown is that there's this song that was released at some point in the 1980s and we don't know who released it. There's no kind of evidence of many things. And a few people on the video kind of spoke and they were like, um, Fox, I've seen Wang's video. He solved it. Don't worry. It's this person. And as far as I know, I skimmed Wang's videos on it. He's made five of them in total. He has broken down a few things, but the million dollar question still remains unanswered. Whose song is it? Because despite the fact that he has the clues to finding out, he hasn't come to a conclusive answer. And there was someone that came across and said, it was me, it was, it was us the entire time back in the 80s. And he's not convinced, neither am I because these days it's just really easy to come across and go like, oh, it was ours. <laughs> there is still, at least to my understanding, there is no definitive proof of who made this song. No one has come forward with a provable story. And it's an internet mystery that kind of went crazy. People are just searching around like, ooh, who did this? Who's what? It's actually a good song as well. It's actually not half bad. But yeah, it's a, um, a really intriguing concept of like, we, we just don't know who did this. Unless all of the band members have somehow died since, someone knows, someone made that song that is still here today. But we don't have verifiable proof even now. We have another zany, wacky band here. It is Arab on Radar, with classic hits such as God Is Dad, St. Patrick's Gay Parade, and Cocaine Mummy. There's something for everyone here, I'm sure. Listening to their most popular song, My Mind Is A Muffler, you might kind of think, like, what, what are they doing here? The song's not that weird, it's a bit heavy and stuff, but it's not that crazy. I guess they're best known, though, for their live performances, and if you didn't know, they actually got chased out once, opening for Marilyn Manson in a club called Babyhead. And you might be wondering, like, okay, these guys are kind of hard, but why did they get kicked off stage, chased out of the building? And that's because the 1992 formed band, apparently during their live acts, were known for spitting, parodying Down syndrome, apparently, and full nudity. So they were pretty hardcore and also a bit mean, I guess. That's the reason they're on here. That makes a lot more sense than just, you know, their music itself, at least from my understanding, because I guess the creators of the iceberg might have had a different idea in mind. But that's what I found on their Wikipedia. And they also had really weird aliases for their band members, such as Mr. Post Traumatic Stress Disorder, Mr. Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, Mr. Type A. And that's all really controversial. So I can kind of understand why they are, because that is a little bit offbeat and strange. Definitely not everyone's cup of tea. So next up, I have Assassination Classroom opening. So yeah, the Assassination Classroom opening, I'm going to put it here because I haven't watched the show, but I have contacted my friend who has. And I think his best guess is that the, I guess, lyrics and sound of the song are very much different to what they're actually saying they're doing. The concept of the show is that they want to kill their teacher for some reason. I'm not too sure. Again, I haven't seen it. But I guess the intro is really, really lighthearted and upbeat. And then as the show goes on, I guess it still kind of starts staying upbeat. But the conversation it just gets darker and darker and darker as it goes, which I think is a really interesting concept, to be fair, because it shows how the show is progressing and getting darker throughout the seasons. I think there was four openings, I think two seasons, four openings, something like that. And yeah, I guess as it goes along, it gets a bit darker. But so, yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure on this one, but either way, I thought it would be fun if we had an anime opening on there as well. Next up, we have Amorphous Androgynous's The Isness, which is definitely a weird three minutes. Um, I'll give it that, you know, this is really starting to get down into 
the kind of weird and wacky. It's just three minutes of some string instruments and some like woodwinds. And I believe at the end of the song, there is the indistinguishable sound of seagulls at the beach and kind of waves crashing in. The song itself actually belongs to a 2002 album of the same name, as previously mentioned, released by Amorphous Androgynous. And the story of this album, compared to at least some of the other entries, I believe is quite tame. So I think I might be missing something here, but the song itself is just weird. And of course, if the band creating its name is Amorphous Androgynous, you already know that there's going to be some things that are a little bit outside society's kind of, I guess, preconceived notions of normality, some weirdness in there. The cover art for the album is quite weird, and the album itself is about six hours, but it is a very abstract time. So moving on next, we have Silver Gunner, who I actually quite like because what Silver Gunner does is they're like, I guess, a band that's like a non-for-profit YouTube experimental band. So you'll be on YouTube and you'll try and find a song and then you might click on Silver Gunner's thinking that it was a legitimate thing and then they'll do something weird inside the video like I think I watched this one which was I think it was like a day in the life but instead it was this anime song over the beat of a day in the life which I thought was quite fun They focus a lot around memes and stuff and they do remixes and just collabs and mishmashes that don't really seem to work together, but they actually kind of do. So their bass and switch style is really what separates them from most people out there making parodies. It's interesting, it's innovative, and it is a bit strange. So really lovely job there. And to be honest, the quality of their music, despite it not being what you go in for, is actually still good. It just so happens that a lot of people are like, wait, I wanted to see, you know, this, that. And it's actually just this meme song. I can definitely see that there's a lot of effort put in there, so I can appreciate that much. The next one on the iceberg, I actually want to give a quick shout out to the creators of this iceberg because I have no idea how they find some of this stuff, but it is Charles Dodge, and I believe the song is He Destroyed Her Image. Now, the thing is, this isn't as much of a song as it is someone speaking into a microphone with their voice fluctuating. Kind of like the tuning of the radio, it's speeding up and slowing down and kind of... But they can't ever find a kind of status quo to stop. A lot of the audio is also distorted, so it's kind of difficult to understand what they're trying to get at a lot of the time. You know, and it will stop and start and stop and start again. And the reason I guess I'm giving a shout out to the creator is that this guy, Charles Dodge, only has about 500 monthly listens on Spotify. So the fact that these guys can find this really weird artists and stuff despite being literally a needle in the haystack him and a bunch of others is quite impressive so props to the creators i'll give you a proper shout out right at the end hitler only has one ball by i'm gonna have to bleep a lot of that so this was just a complete displeasure to listen to i'm not really a metal fan okay but i can at least appreciate the fans and stuff i think that the fans are really chill and although it's just a bit too heavy for me i can understand that there is a lot going on that i guess i've never been damaged enough to understand because it's quite a deep genre having said that when you get to the even heavier stuff like death metal and stuff to me that's just noise like i can't hear anything out of that and hitler only has one ball is kind of the same where it's just low pitched shouting in your ear and it's really annoying <laughs> I think it takes like the kind of backing track of the Halloween song, like the dun 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 that one. It's a minute and twenty two that I wish I had back, but it's just one of the worst songs ever conceived in my opinion. It's just annoying. Fun band name, fun song title, really bad song. True Love by Fred Firth. This is one that I don't really hate too much. It's not really much to me. I think it's only here because of its obscurity. It's kind of like a song, I think it's like made in the eighties very shouty however i think that it might be on here because of the story that's going on in the background i guess in the lyrics and stuff there's this guy and he's shouting to what i believe is his girlfriend and she's being very violent on how she's just gonna like hurt herself or something like that and this is behind kind of an upbeat joyous tune so you definitely do get the juxtaposition between what's being said and how it's sounding
quite violent, quite graphic in its description. And I, I think it's about this guy's girlfriend being mad, but it's such an obscure song. It only has like 4,000 views on YouTube that it's kind of hard to research too much from here on out. I can only really get what I'm given and see and can hear. Any Fred Firth fans in the comments, <laughs> let me know. This is one of the worst songs I've ever listened to as far as obscure music goes. I'm sorry that you weren't blessed with decent taste in music. <laughs> Baby gets scared whenever they listen to obscure music outside of King Crimson and yes. I really do hope that my Spotify recommendations don't get really messed up after this because this video is going to be a bit of a uh, ache to research if all I'm getting <laughs> recommended afterwards is like Hitler has one ball but... <laughs> Next up, we have Thomas Truax, who I really actually like. I think he is fantastic because he's not so much known for his music as he is inventing musical instruments. And he does them in really interesting and gothic, fascinating ways. Just looking at his instruments, they're really cool. And I think they've been described as almost ripped out of a Tim Burton film. It's, it's just fascinating to see how many people can kind of come up with creative ways to make music. They have like a really steampunk aesthetic, and I'd really like to see how they work in most I'm sure in most of his songs he actually does use them, if not all of his songs. I don't know if he's ever picked up a guitar in his life, but he does make his own instruments, which look really, really cool. And they work because he is a musician at the end of the day. So that's kind of cool for me, at least. Alvin Lucier is at the next point of the iceberg and his music is definitely out there, kind of one of a kind. He's more experimental I guess than a few of these just in the fact that he studies I guess music and stuff and I believe that he was a professor a Wesleyan so quite an intelligent guy with classic songs such as I'm sitting in a room and chorus and instruments too <laughs> the highly awaited sequel of chorus and instruments <laughs> what isn't there to love about Alvin Lucier on Wikipedia it says he studies the power of audio quite a lot so he's a real studier and having listened to I'm sitting in a room basically what he does is he just talks and then he describes what he's going to be doing which is like I guess kind of looping his audio back and then like making it really echoey or something like that and then as it comes back it gets more distorted and eventually by the end of the 20 minutes almost becomes its own song, I guess, its own music. I am sitting in a room different from the one you are in now. Extremely experimental, but also really, really kind of, I guess, just fascinating to listen to. Just that the spoken word, if distorted enough, can become like an instrumental track. He sounds like Winnie the Pooh as well. I thought I'd just mentioned that. So a uh, shout out Alvin Lucier. Okay, this next one is a little bit out of my depth. And I do apologize for bringing it up because I think that this is kind of a really interesting rabbit hole to go down. But I don't understand this in the slightest. So I'm going to read off the Wikipedia page verbatim so that you can try and understand a little bit of what's going on if you can. I don't understand it personally, but you might be able to kind of put some things together if you understand the words being said. So here we go. The Conant Project is a five CD set of recordings of numbers stations and noise stations, which are shortwave radio stations with geographical markers and unknown locations believed to be operated by government agencies to communicate with deployed spies, many of which are defunct. Now, do I understand anything about kind of radio waves? No. Do I understand anything about spies? No. But what it seems to me is that they were using, I guess, radio stations to communicate messages to and from spies, I believe, in the Cold War. That's at least my understanding. That's what I think it's trying to get at. But I am by no means a Conant Project expert or anything. I don't think anyone is because I believe that none of these have been deciphered. If I'm wrong and you do know something about the Conant Project, please let me know down below because I'd be really interested to find out just a little bit of what's going on here. The noises, the sounds are really strange. They're really strange. But I guess since they were on a radio station, that makes them you know, music, right? It's just a bit too obscure for me. And by the way, apologies if you can hear any chickens in the background. I don't think you can, but there's some chickens that are shouting about and it's really starting to get on my nerves. <laughs> Architecture in Helsinki. When I saw this on the iceberg, I was actually kind of pleasantly surprised because I remember these guys from FIFA 12, FIFA 13 with Escapee. I love that song. But 
in reflection, when I look back at some of their music videos, they are very, very weird. The Iceberg has linked me to this song called Heart It Races, and this is very abstract. It's very out there. It's very weird. Escapee, I believe, also had a weird music video too. I remember it was some kid that was trying to run away from some old perf. <laughs> and uh, Heart It Races is also another one. I think the dress is skeletons, but it's just very kind of aloof. And whilst, yes, I do remember that they had some weird music videos, this one, Heart It Races, probably does take the cake for the strangest. And next up, we have the most unwanted song. So this one was made by Komar, Melmaid and Soldier. And this is a ride. I highly suggest you listen to this after the video. But basically, it starts off all westerny, not too bad. And then... The strangest thing happens. This soprano voiced woman begins rapping. Now, soprano and rap don't really go together. Not really. <laughs> rap is best left to people with a bit deeper voices because it's it just doesn't sound right with soprano singing it. Falsetto voice just doesn't really go in rap and she's got her vibrato going or whatever and like it just doesn't fit. It's a match made in hell. Then it turns slower and bagpipes start playing and this is all in the same song, right? It's a 20 minute song. Bagpipes start playing and you're like, wait, what's going on? And it's just kids screaming and bagpipes just going off. Bagpipes, unfortunately, being perhaps one of the most annoying musical instruments to listen to. So they're like blasting off really, really poorly. And then and they're like, oh, it's Christmas. And there's just no structure here because it goes from a Western to a rap to bagpipes. So now it's Christmas. And I skipped ahead just to see what like the grand finale of the song is because I'm not listening to this for 20 minutes. And at the end, it's this big political drama, I guess. There's like more rapping eventually. And it's just awful. It's really, really laughably bad. <laughs> and the thing is, people had to rehearse this because this is a 20 minute song. Someone had to write this. Someone had to rehearse this. Someone had to perform this. Someone had to put it together. And I don't think that this is meant for shits and giggles. I think this is legitimate. And it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. It's the biggest car crash I have ever seen put to song. We're almost at the bottom now, so let's get there. Klaus Nomi is up next. A very, very strange guy. He's very strange and very out there. Personally, I don't really like his music. Having said that, I am glad that it exists because it is just so out of human experience. It's unique. It's out there. It's just so detached from anything you would usually see. Nomi was born in 1944 and died in 1983 from an AIDS-related illness. He is remembered for his dabble in the theatrical, his heavy makeup, his brilliant costume design and vocal range. Very peculiar figure, but one that is just kind of awe-inspiring to see how different things can be. Nurse with a Wound, the music video linked to this, is scary. Like, it, it is a creepy, creepy, disturbing time. Definitely one of the scarier music videos I've ever seen. This song for Bottom Feeder. <laughs> They absolutely got their horror down to a T. I'm sure whoever made the video went on to do great things. The music itself is experimental as hell. It's just weirdness after weirdness after weirdness after weirdness. The music video really goes with it because it's just strange. It's abstract. I can't really think of many more synonyms for weird, but it is that. It is creepy. It's harrowing. It is, it's disturbed a little bit. It's kind of hard for me to describe the music to you and it's kind of hard to play it without getting copyright strike. But definitely, if you're into the weirder side of things and creepier, more disturbing stuff, I would recommend giving it a look. Be warned though, it is just a little bit, oh God, it, it, it's, it definitely is a bit creepy. Winnie Pooh. I don't really know what I'm watching anymore. These guys are crazy. You have them in these really weird kind of costumes. There's the drummers that are rotating upside down. That must be so hard to do. That's got to be so hard. And their music itself is absolutely off the walls 
bonkers. They're wearing like Chewbacca masks and the editing is just as wild as the performance. It's just erratic and it fits, but it's one of those things where I'm looking at it and I'm like, what am I watching here? Obviously this is music, but it's so far detached from what we would usually see. Really high pitched singing, sounds like someone's moaning in the background. It has to be commended just for how out there it is. Indescribable again, just because of how much is going on. It's absolutely one of those things that I just love to see. Yeah, Unsuck Chin, Alice in Wonderland 2007 Opera. I don't know what's going on here, but this is creepy, man. This is creepy and strange and anything you want to say, this is it. Because it takes the classic kind of Alice in Wonderland and it's like a really, really bad shrooms trip, man. It's so bad. <laughs> For some reason, there's an evil Mickey Mouse in there. I didn't think he was in the original. And everyone, the costume design is so... Oh, God. In a way, though, because it's just so completely mad, it's almost exactly what Alice in Wonderland should be. Just a complete mind explosion of creativity and outside the box thinking. I'm sure it will haunt my dreams tonight. Actually, last night my dreams were haunted. I had a lot of nightmares last night. So <laughs> maybe it's because I'm looking into this kind of stuff. That's how the law works. I mean, what do you want me to say? This thing has 658 views. The creators have four subscribers. <laughs> Shouts out if you're one of the four. They have some really interesting song titles. The music actually has something to it, which it does actually, to be fair. It kind of like, it focuses a lot on video games and that kind of stuff, which is not new, but at least it's something. And this is another one where I'm just wondering how did the creators of the iceberg find this in the first place? Again, these guys have four subscribers and 600 views. So the fact that this is even on there in the first place is like, it's just crazy to me. It's just music. It's so obscure that you would never find it because again four people have <laughs> let's just get onto these last few the sonic cd hidden message screen i'm not a sonic fan i don't know anything about the sonic game that this is from and this is just too obscure for me but reading the comments i guess i can kind of understand a few clues as to why this might be down here and it's because people were just really creeped out that this could happen the comments are always memeing because, you know, Sonic fans and stuff, but I believe that this is perhaps some sort of glitch that you can get in the Sonic game, and then you're taken to this hidden screen with this creepy music playing over the top. Definitely eerie. I don't know if there's any, like, meaning behind it, or if this is just some sort of creepy pasta, or if this is actually something that you could do. I'm sure I'll probably get a bunch of comments saying, like, oh, I can't believe you don't know this one. I don't care about Sonic, so... <laughs> anyway, down to the bottom of the iceberg. We have the last thing that I'll be showing you today is Bull of Heaven. Doesn't sound too crazy, does it? But when you get down to it, this is kind of weird because I believe that this is like a music piece or album or whatever you want to call it. This is five years long. <laughs> you will never be able to listen to it all. And it's mostly just distorted sounds. It doesn't really have too, too much in there but it is the longest piece of music ever and it's practically just drivel how they made it five years long i will have no idea i think they probably just looped a lot of stuff and it's not like anyone's going to check because the thing is five years long it's not like someone just sat there for five years playing the drums <laughs> interesting to see i don't think there's any kind of hidden meaning there maybe these guys just wanted the kind of guinness world record of longest song i don't think there is any hidden meaning here i think this is just so weird it's gone past hidden meaning and now it's just madness. So anyway, that is it from me. Before you go, I have a really cool announcement and that is that at some point in October, I'm going to be starting my very own radio show. So there'll be a lot more information on that as it unfolds. So stay tuned for that. I really would like a few of you guys to come along and listen because I would say that my music taste is a bit more obscure than the average person. I generally listen to quite local bands and smaller bands. I'm an indie fan, but not like a purist or anything, but I still do listen to people with like 2,000 monthly listens on Spotify and stuff like that compared to like mega pop stars. So please do come along. I'll release more details for that in due time. Apart from that, how about you give me a little sub if you don't mind? It's uh, would be very nice and we're almost on 18k now. We're more than halfway through 17k. So please sub. I've got an Instagram and a Twitter that you could follow me on. You can send iceberg requests to foxkimbo at gmail.com if you have any that you think I should cover. And I also have a Patreon which you could support if you wanted to. Shout out to Cage101101 101 101 and Chris 
M for being my backers. And speaking of shout outs, very big shout out to FTZ PLTC, Tungsten underscore Oof, and Milk Walker. FTZ PLTC, massive shout out to you because this is about the third or fourth iceberg of yours I've covered. You've got some great ideas, mate. Thank you very, very much. And the other two, also huge shout outs for creating a massive iceberg. I missed out quite a few entries. So if this video does well, I might be able to come back, reassess, reevaluate, and maybe do some more entries later down the line. And aside from that, please let me know down in the comments what you'd like to see me do next, because I'm only 70 videos in and I'm already out of ideas. Thank you for watching.